Well, Stephen, welcome to New Zealand. Thank you very much for sparing time to come in and talk to us. You're a very interesting chap because, I mean, I've been talking to you for a few minutes. You're you're very gentle and obviously intelligent chap you you're easy to talk to and yet wherever you go you seem to court controversy why is that well i think that there is a, a group of people in our world who have such a strong passion for israel who uh, are convinced from scripture that god has brought the jewish people back to the land and that he's doing something special there anyone who questions that or has a burden for the rights of other people in that area, like the Palestinians, that's a threat to their theology and it's a threat to their view of the future, what they believe God is doing. And sadly, um, they have taken it very personally. And it's a classic, um, classic approach. When you can't handle the message, you go for the messenger. And I think that's what's been happening here in this visit to New Zealand. It's a small minority of what I would call Christian Zionists who see it as their mission to uh, discredit me and what uh, Tier Fund and Laidlaw College and others are doing in promoting a series of events to actually raise the issue. What is God doing in Israel-Palestine today? Let's talk a little bit about, uh, about that, that whole issue. Now, on your own blog, um, I don't know, you, in, in your books as well, you quote John Stott who said, Christians should be pro-Semitic in that we recognize how the people of Israel have been highly favored by God we Gentiles are their debtors. So that, that would seem to me to be a fairly clear um, injunction for, for us to be very supportive of the Jewish people. Exactly. I'm pro-Israel, but I'm also pro-Palestinian because I want a secure Israel. And the only way we can ensure a secure Israel with peace and justice is to uh, allow the Palestinians the same right of self-determination. Um, you know, there will be no peace in the Middle East, no security for Israel until there's justice for the Palestinians. But that should not allow us to tolerate racism, whether it's Islamophobia, demonizing Muslims or Arabs, any more than anti-Semitism, demonizing Jewish people. I mean, it's interesting you talk about demonizing Islam. There is no doubt that, that a, a lot of, of the terrorism attacks in the world tend to come from from an Islamist fundamentalist background. So that's understandable that people are, are nervous of, of Islam. And people very often forget to ask the question, why? Why are some Muslims so upset with the West, with Britain, with America, uh, that they resort to violence? And you have to look back in history and see the way that uh, Britain and Europe were crusading in the Middle East using the Bible to justify ethnic cleansing in the Middle East, how the Bible was used in South Africa to justify apartheid, uh, how uh, American Christians used the Bible to justify slavery. Uh, and you have to ask, well, there are some reasons, explicable reasons, why some people do not like us. Uh, the way that uh, the West has uh, bombed Iraq, uh, destroyed much of the infrastructure there, killed hundreds of thousands of people, to do what? And what have we achieved in Afghanistan or Iraq? So uh, I'm not justifying the use of violence in response, but one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. Uh, virtually every single US, uh, Israeli politician, certainly prior to Netanyahu's generation, was a terrorist. They attacked and killed British soldiers uh, before the declaration of independence. They disavowed the violence. They became politicians. Uh, but uh, Begin, Shamir, Rabin, they were all terrorists in the eyes of the British because they killed British uh, soldiers who were there to uphold the rule of law in Israel. Israel itself feels under threat. I'm, I've, I've been there and I've spoken to Palestinian people, I've spoken to, to Jewish people, um, but uh, Jewish Israelis feel that they are surrounded by enemies on all sides and you have people like uh, Yasser Arafat who on the very day that they were signing the Oslo Peace Accord, on that very day, he said that they were just looking for an opportunity to launch attacks against Israel. You can understand why, particularly in Israel, they are very concerned about what, what they look out towards. Very definitely, and I sympathize with those in Israel who are afraid of their neighbors. But the best defense is a good neighbor. 
And the way to have good neighbors is to be a good neighbor. And for the last 50, 60 years, Israel has been ethnically cleansing the Palestinian territories, demolishing homes on a daily basis, uh, building illegal settlements on other people's land, creating an apartheid structure system of separate roads, separate schools, separate healthcare systems, uh, keeping the Palestinian three million people under military occupation for decades. And we're surprised that they resist that uh, or they treat uh, Israel uh, in, in, uh, you know, as, as the enemy. Um, until we have the rule of international law imposed, go back to the 67 borders and allow a Palestinian state, there will be no security for Israel. The other side of it is to say that Israel is the fourth largest nuclear power in the world. It has chemical, biological, nuclear weapons. It signed no uh, non-proliferation treaties. Uh, it's a major arms exporter in the world. So it's hardly the little uh, David v. the Goliath. Um, we, you know, we're dealing with a complex situation, but the, the basic issue is the rights of the Palestinians uh, and, and satisfying those rights will lead to the security for Israel. Israel is the only country in the world that's never defined its borders. It wants to be recognized, uh, but it won't, won't declare what its borders are. And until it is willing to recognize Palestinians' right to be recognized, then uh, it's unfair to expect it to be recognized either. The, the, I guess the, the thing that people always bring up, and, and when I've spoken to friends who knew you were coming in today, uh, and in fact I was interviewing someone who had been a member of the IDF in, in Israel, sitting in that very seat a few weeks back, they talk about the missile attacks coming across from, from Gaza, they, they talk about the, the threat of terrorism on their borders, and it, it's almost like neither side, neither side is ever going to give way how on earth are we ever going to get some sort of settlement? We're not dealing with an asymmetric war. We're not dealing with two peoples, like two boys in a, in a playground, two bullies or two, two boys having a fight. We're not in that kind of situation. Uh, Israel is uh, a sophisticated, modern uh, democracy with uh, serious military hardware. As I said, chemical, biological, nuclear weapons. It has the best quality uh, weapons, nuclear submarines, uh, a, a first-class navy, uh, where, you know, aircraft supplied by the American uh, 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 military establishment. Against what? Against uh, uh, small groups of individuals who have Kalashnikovs uh, and so on, and and make uh, homemade rockets. Uh, it's not to justify the use of either any of those weapons, but we're dealing with an asymmetric war. And then as long as you suppress people's basic human rights and deny them the right to freedom of movement, freedom of expression of religion, access to health care, decent education, uh, as long as you suppress them and, and control their lives in the way that Israel is doing in the occupied territories, we shouldn't be surprised that some are so frustrated and so upset by the behavior that they resort to violence. Uh, but as we saw in Northern Ireland, uh, you had atheist uh, uh, Catholics and atheist Protestants killing each other. They had a lot of support from both com communities until the women, the mothers, until the politicians, and until the, the you know, people on both sides, the religious leaders said, we've had enough. We've got to resort to diplomacy and, and, uh, and, and the ballot box to resolve our conflict. And when they began to shift from the use of weapons to, um, to negotiation, the extremists on both sides were marginalized. Uh, we've seen that in Yugoslavia, we've seen it in, uh, with the fall of the communist war, we've seen it in South Africa with the fall of apartheid. None of those things took place through a war. It was through civil society saying, we refuse to continue to hate. Uh, we, want, we want to live in peace and we've got to learn to live in peace with our neighbors. If we can do it in other parts of the world, uh, I believe the role of the church here in, in the West New Zealand, in Britain, is to be peacemakers, not widow makers. And what worries me is that the religious theology of Christian Zionism is perpetuating the conflict by demonizing one side and eulogizing the other. It just sounds, it sounds great, but just having seen both sides, I can't see that happening. I just, I just can't see them coming together. Well, it happens on the ground when you refuse to hate. Uh, we have friends, uh, Tier Fund is working in, in Israel-Palestine in the occupied territories with uh, charities, Bethlehem Bible College, Holy Land Trust, uh, Musalaha, which is a reconciliation project that brings Jews and Palestinians together. It's risky, 
Uh, it needs courage and it needs faith to achieve anything, but it's working uh, and, and there are small signs of hope there. Um, and that, that's the reason I'm determined to keep speaking about the need for uh, an international settlement based on a two-state solution or a one state where uh, we have civil rights for Palestinians and Israelis uh, and, and helping uh, the church understand how to read the Bible in the way that uh, God has called us to love our enemies, pray for those who persecute us and refuse to allow those who hate to intimidate uh, or, or to win. We'll come back and talk about the theological side of things in just a couple of minutes. And welcome back to Enzyme Focus. Our guest on the program today is Stephen Sizer, who is a minister from the UK, visiting New Zealand at the moment to talk about the Middle East, a uh, subject in which he is something of an expert. Stephen, we, before the break, we were talking about, about political solutions to to what goes on between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. But from what you're saying, it's not just political, is it? That there's, there is that whole faith side to it. And you've mentioned a couple of times Christian Zionists. Just step back slightly and tell us what, what's a Christian Zionist? Okay. <clears throat> the, the rise of Zionism as a political movement uh, came out of Eastern Europe, out of the pogroms, the suffering of the Jewish people. The, uh, the leaders in the Jewish community in the 19th century were secular Jews. They were not religious, they were secular, people like Theodor Herzl. And it was a time when the old empires, the British Empire, the Ottoman Empire and so on were shrinking. And uh, people all over Europe were calling for independence, for national sovereignty. Uh, as, as same in Africa and South, South America. Um, and within that rise of nationalist movements, the Jewish community was seeking independence, somewhere to live in the world where they would be safe and secure from, you know, from, uh, from centuries of suffering. And um, in the 18, from the 1820s onwards, there was a growth of, of thinking in the church, um, largely from people on the edge of the church, um, who hold a very literalistic view of the Bible, and had a, a view of the future that uh, was, was very apocalyptic. It gave rise to people like the Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, the Millerites, the Adventists. You saw the rise of what we call today proto-Zionism, proto-Christian Zionism, because it was 50 years ahead of its time. And Christians like uh, Edward Irving, uh, John Darby, and others began to speculate about uh, the role of Britain as the superpower, having defeated the French, uh, vying up against Russia. Uh, it was their destiny to bring the Jews back to Palestine as part of the British Empire and secure our trade routes to India and Africa. And so it was political expediency partly driven, but it was also partly driven by a way of reading the Bible and saying there are prophecies here that have never been fulfilled, for the Jewish people, they must be fulfilled in the future. And so that gave rise to organizations that out of humanitarian care and compassion for Jewish people helped set up orphanages, schools, uh, in the belief that the Jews would come to faith in Jesus and then be returned to Palestine as a Christian nation. It didn't happen. But by the 1870s, 1880s, you saw the ch uh, Christian leaders becoming a bit more pragmatic. They saw the value of the Jews back in the land for Britain's control of the world, the empire, but they also believed that the Jews would return to the land first, then they'd return to the Lord. So Zionism would have got as far as perhaps the PKK, you know, the, uh, the, the Kurdish liberation movement or the Armenian aspiration for a homeland. It would have got about as far as that were it not for Western Christians, largely British Christians, who got behind Zionism, lobbied for its recognition, helped to fund it and helped to steer America and British governments toward uh, acknowledging and recognizing a state in Palestine. Uh, in the 20th century, as Britain declined in its influence in the world, America took over and the Zionist lobby switched its, its interest from Britain to America. And so from the 60s onwards, you see a, a, a marriage occurring, a, a marriage of convenience between the Israeli right, Menachem Begin, and the evangelical right, Jerry Falwell, uh, with the influence of Ronald Reagan and before him, uh, uh, Jimmy Carter. And so today, Christian Zionism is a, a political movement, a very influential movement in American churches especially, that believes that what we see happening in our world today 
is God's will. The return of the Jews to the land is an accident, it's, it's fulfillment of Bible prophecy, and therefore the role of the church is to support Israel. And any notion that Israel's got to withdraw from the land of the territories uh, in order to find peace is seen as a compromise with Satan because the borders of Israel uh, in Genesis are from Egypt to Iraq. So there's, there's, there's support for the settlement program, support for the recognition of Jerusalem as their capital, um, and a, not an attack, but, a, but an antipathy toward Arabs, Muslims, and Christians who question this theological framework. But there is that verse, isn't there, in Genesis about um, blessing those who bless, I will bless Israel those who bless and, you and cursing those who curse you. Curse. Sure. So, I mean, that, that seems fairly unequivocal. Obvious, yeah, it is. But it was a promise made to Abraham, and if you look at the promise, it wasn't said to anyone else. It was a promise made to Abraham, no one else. And when we get to the New Testament, yes, there were several promises God made to Abraham. I'll bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. I give you this land from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates, and so on. But you have to ask, as Christians, how does the New Testament help us to understand the Old Testament? We don't read, them, uh, we don't read the Old Testament as if the New Testament wasn't written. And in Galatians 3... Uh, the Apostle Paul says, the promises God made to Abraham were to Abraham and to his seed. And it says, it does not say seeds, meaning many people, but one seed, meaning Jesus Christ. So the promises God made to Abraham are fulfilled in and through Jesus. And then Galatians goes on to say, uh, and we are all children of Abraham by faith. I, we inherit those promises on the basis of faith, not race. And what I do in my books, uh, Zion's Christian Soldiers and others, is show that the promises God made in the Hebrew Scriptures were always inclusive of the other nations. The, the Jewish community, the Israelites, were not a, a racial group, a pure racial group that traced their ancestry back to Abraham. They embraced people of many other nations who came to recognize the one true God. Egyptians came out of uh, Egypt uh, you know, in the Exodus. Um, Esther chapter uh, 7 says that uh, many other races became Jews in the time of Esther. So when we get to the New Testament, what do we find? Uh, God's people made up of all nations. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Um, so God's people have always been inclusive, never on the basis of race, always on the basis of faith. So I see a continuity between Israel and the church. The church hasn't replaced Israel. The church is Israel, God's people in continuity. So what is Israel's place then in, in terms of, of, I guess, us as God's people? What is, is God's will for Israel? Yeah, know? I mean, Israel still has a special, it, a special pull on us, doesn't it? It does. It resonates with evangelicals especially because we love the Bible and we read stories about Israel in the Old Testament. We see Israel today and we equate the two. And that's, that's something we should be very careful about doing because Israel today is not Israel of the Old Testament. Israel in the Old Testament was a monarchy. It, was, uh, it revolved around the temple and the obedience to the law. Israel today is largely a secular state. Uh, it does not read the Bible the way that we read the Bible. It's repudiated Jesus. So while I would defend Israel's right to exist as a state, I respect people's right to self-determination, I defend Israel's right to exist alongside Palestine. I wouldn't use the Bible to justify it. In the New Testament, when it talks about God's will for the Jewish people, what is his will? They recognize their Messiah. They become citizens of uh, the new heaven and the new earth. Not that they uh, enjoy God's blessing in the land as if the land and uh, nationhood was God's will for the Jewish people. That was merely a temporary means by which they would come to know the Messiah. So what should be, us as Christians in the West, what should be our responsibility to, to the Jews? Well, I look to the story of the, of the Good Samaritan. You know, the story of the Good Samaritan. First of all, we make the mistake calling it the Good Samaritan. The word good doesn't appear in the story. So we've already interpreted it, the Bible. It's a very <laughs> dangerous thing to do. But you remember what it was. The, the lawyer asked Jesus, you know, what should I do? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind strength, love your neighbor as yourself. So the lawyer says, well, who is my neighbor? What, Jesus, what he wanted Jesus to do is draw a line. Tell me who's my neighbor and who I can ignore. And so Jesus tells the story. But in the story of the Samaritan, okay, um, Jesus throws in one little sentence in the middle of the story 
that we normally gloss over, we don't even remember it's there because we focus on the priest and the Levite and the, good, and the Samaritan. But he tells us something about the condition of the guy who got beaten up and left in the road. And that was what created the dilemma for the people walking down the road. What does Jesus tell us about the guy on the road? He says, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him up and left him half dead, which means he was naked and he was unconscious. Now, what did that do to the man? And what did it do for the people going down the road? You know, when you walk down the street in Auckland uh, and you see someone lying in the road, if it's a nicely dressed white woman, middle class, are you gonna walk by? But if it's someone of color in rags with a, 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 a bottle of whiskey by his side, are you gonna stop? The guy in the road was a human being. That was the dilemma. Am I gonna stop for a human being? They couldn't tell, is he one of us or is he one of them? That's how we should treat Jewish people today. Not distinguish or differentiate. Oh, he's a Jew, we've got to treat him differently. We should treat everyone that we meet in the same way, the way Jesus treated us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates his love for us in this. So when Jesus throws it back to the religious leader, he says, okay, which of the three was a neighbor? Not a good neighbor. Which of the three was a neighbor? Because you're either a neighbor or you're not a neighbor. And the guy can't bring himself to say the Samaritan. He's still resisting Jesus, but he says, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and do the same. Go and do the same. I, I go one stage further. I think as I read the New Testament, I think we should treat people the way we treat Jesus. And if Jesus was sitting here today, would I treat him differently? I should treat others the way I would treat Jesus, respectfully uh, and, and honor him. That's the best way to win people for Jesus, to treat them the way God treats them. So that's how we should treat the Jewish people. And I want to defend Israel's right to exist, but I also uh, am a passionate believer that the Palestinians have the same right because Christ died for them too. It has been fascinating to talk to you, Stephen. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.